ما نعرفش شنو بيزون The literal translation to anyone here who doesn't understand Maltese is I don't know what fear is. My late grandfather, God bless his soul, used to say this phrase whenever his life got challenging. And he passed on to my mother, and my mother says this phrase whenever her life gets challenging. So it comes as no surprise that whenever my life gets challenging, my mother's phrase to me is Manafshinu Biza. But as a young child, I never fully grasped the how. How can someone not know what fear is? Distinguished guests and colleagues, my name is Chloe Lauren Kauke. I'm a newly turned 21 year old human being, law student, active citizen, and also a work in progress. I am an inquisitive young adult, coming from a strong lineage of women that tested social barriers and stood up for what was right time and time again. I have been inspired by people from all walks of life, from literally all corners of the world, from the United States to Palau, and from different times, because that are present here, to Maya Angelou, for example. I have been taught to look at challenges in the eye and not feel any fear. As a student at the Maltese educational system, we are taught about a very important historical episode that happened in 1565. I'm assuming that at least half of the students that went through the Maltese educational system know what I'm referring to. This episode shifted the trajectory of Maltese history and Maltese culture. Basically, the islands of Malta were attempted to be conquered by the Ottoman Empire in what is known as the Great Siege. Malta, with the help of the Knights of St. John, won the nearly four-month siege because the Maltese are strong and look challenges in the eye and not feel fear. But why? Why not feel fear? How does someone not feel fear? Could it actually be? So I did a little bit of research. The truth is that unless you have some sort of specific permanent brain damage, everyone feels fear. It's necessary for survival. According to a 2019 article published by the University of Alabama, some types of fears, such as that of heights and insects, are still linked to the instinctual need for survival. Today's stimuli can obviously be very different to what used to be the fear that we're referring to for survival here. However, the bodily response is still the same. Our physiological response to fear can be intense. Some people are just better at handling it than others. I have been active within my regional, national, and international community for nearly a decade now. It all started with attending English-speaking unions, public speaking, and debating workshops when I was around 12 years old. The truth is, I've always had a lot to say, and I love talking. So when the school approached me to join these workshops, I immediately said yes. ESU made me feel empowered for the first time in my life. They made me feel that my voice was heard and it was loud enough to get heard, that my voice was worth something more than I ever thought, that my passions, human rights, were something I could work on. The injustices around us could also be something that I could work on. However, public speaking or glossophobia is considered to be the number one fear of the human population. People prefer being in the casket than delivering the eulogy in a funeral. I don't know if anyone knew that. But why? Studies show that it stems to one main thing, anxiety. Anxiety tells me, the speaker, that if you don't accept what I am saying or enjoy it, that I am immediately shut out. I can imagine that no one really tries to catch that kind of feeling. I enjoy public speaking. I enjoy it so much that I nowadays compete within the public speaking sector. I started competing in regional and national competitions, and I'm currently the JCI Europe public speaking champion. I face a tough world championships in a very few short weeks, which my phone likes to remind me of. And the truth is, I'm scared. I'm terrified. Fear is present, and in a way, I'd be extremely worried if it wasn't, because it's a big deal. 
Because whilst my grandfather and my mother state, I don't know what fear is, I could never relate to them, because I do know what fear is. Fear is what got me into activism. Fear of losing my rights, my safety, my country, my world, is what got me to start talking louder and clearer for what I stand for. Fear that one day my values will be questioned and tested is what made them cast in iron and made me so unbending. Fear is one of the main indications that I am doing things out of my comfort zone. And I tend to get claustrophobic, so the comfort zone is quite large. It's an indication that I'm growing and learning. And it's an indication that I'm engaging with different peoples about different topics that challenge me to be a better human being. Being a representative of Maltese and Godstein youths internationally is not an easy feat, I must admit. I am aware of the responsibility I hold. I know some of the struggles that my peers and I are going through, but I am also well aware that some of my peers are going through challenges I cannot and probably will never fathom. Going to COP27 and representing Maltese and Godstein youths was an honor. However, I do not remember being fearless when I was asked to speak about climate change, sustainability and youths in front of an audience of that magnitude. But I do remember the anticipation that I felt that I could help something, that in this case, youths, people, the cause. And then the anticipation of growing through that experience kept me intrigued, and ultimately, it overshadowed that fear. It is what made me say yes to be the Maltese delegate to the European Youth Forum and the Southern Youth Councils. It's what made me say yes to being a Maltese Commonwealth Youth Exchange Ambassador and subsequently and currently a Royal Commonwealth Society Fellow. It's what made me say yes to go to COP28, which will be happening in a few weeks. It has made me confident enough to moderate climate sustainability panels in front of Women to Women, which is basically an organization that I am a proud alumni of, that inspires young leaders, girls from the ages of 15 to 19, emerging leaders coming from every single country in this world. It is that anticipation that made saying yes to being the president of Malta Model United Nations exciting and not just plain scary. The same anticipation was channeled by 12-year-old Dwight Chloe as she sat and wrote poetry about the world around her, which was eventually published. It is the same anticipation that I felt when I was 16 and doing MEP for the first time, leading to be a committee president and actually then helping out with the presidency. It is also that anticipation that made 18-year-old Chloe say yes to be part of the National Youth Council. Three years later, I still form part of it and dedicate my time to speak and write and research about what needs to change. It's that anticipation that I feel as well as I prepare for the JCI World's Public Speaking Championships. The same anticipation was there when the life choices I had to make were presented as black or white, and also when they were presented as green and slightly darker green. It is the same feeling that inspired movements such as, but not limited to, suffragettes, the civil rights movements, the gay rights movements. That the injustice present would not fade if fear overtook. One of my best friends is a physics student. And earlier today, she reminded me that power is calculated by multiplying the mass with the velocity. It's a formula that I believe can be adapted for the activism sector. Mass can be quantified as the amount we have to lose. Velocity, the speed till time runs out. And power is power. But why? Why did my grandfather say manaf shinobiza every single time his life got tough? I'm sorry but it just does not resonate with me. So, Nanno, Oma, I'm changing your phrase. I'm going to say, which translates to, do not let fear stop you. Thank you.